Okay, here we go. Um, the Byzantine Empire. So we're kind of shifting gears. The last uh, video that you just watched is about the early Christian church. And again, that foundational piece um, to the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, and fun fact, I always have students that are like, why are they called Catholics? Like, what, what is Catholic? Catholic is just Christian in Latin, guys. So it's just the Roman Christian Church. So it always cracks me up too when I have students that are like, Catholics aren't Christians. I'm like, really? Go tell Catholic that. <laughs> so yes, they are. Um, but anyway, so just a little kind of reiteration on a few things from that that we talked about in class today. But we're shifting gears, politic we're going political now into the Byzantine Empire. And there is one emperor that I want you to know about in terms of the Byzantine Empire. And that is this dude right here, Justinian. Okay, Justinian will rule from 527 to 565. And this is what's kind of cool about Justinian. He's actually born a peasant. Okay, his dad, whose name is Justin, um, is going to work his way up in the military and become one of the top bodyguards to the emperor. And the emperor and Justin, again, Justinian's dad, are going to become like very close friends. And um, the emperor, I can't remember the emperor's name that Justin served. I can't remember it. But anyways, it's not that important. But um, he is going to, again, look at Justin as like his right hand man. Well, the emperor doesn't have heirs. He doesn't have an heir. And so he actually brings in Justinian, he brings him into the city and tutors him and educates him and sets him up to be his heir, even though, again, like he's the son of a peasant, was born a peasant. His dad, again, is like the, a bodyguard that worked his way up in the military. Um, but he really was a pretty incredible ruler and takes the Byzantine Empire to its height territorially. Um, so during his reign, he's actually going to take the Byzantine empire to the point where they pretty much control the Mediterranean again. Uh, and he takes back a large portion of land that was conquered by again, the Germanic tribes when Western Rome falls, he's going to reconquer that, um, you know, in the name of Rome, just again, under the Byzantine empire. Now, one of, so that's pretty major that he does. One of his most controversial things is actually his wife, uh, Theodora, but she is truly like a really interesting historical figure. So Theodora was a very successful businesswoman in her own right. And um, she was a prostitute. Okay, she was an actress slash prostitute. So again, here, very unconventional <laughs> leaders. Here he is, born a peasant, married to a prostitute. But she was very, actually very smart. She was very, very street smart, obviously. If she was, you know, and she was, she was a successful businesswoman. I know you're sitting here going, Miss Latham. She was a prostitute, but think about it. And I'm not condoning prostitution whatsoever. It's just historically speaking, historically speaking, if you were a woman, especially, come on, we're in the sixth century. This is what this is the time frame that we're talking about here. If you are a female and you want to be financially independent of any man, what can you sell every day? Well, your body. And so, you know, again, that's, she she was and she was also again she she worked in theater she was an actress and and a prostitute but successful and they were truly like a love match uh justinian falls in love with her she falls of course in love with him and um he appreciates her and and her kind of grit and determination to be kind of this independent woman um, she is very much like a feminist for her day. She fights for women's rights within the Byzantine Empire. Um, and she helps him a lot of, in a lot of ways, like lead 
and and saves him from oblivion actually in the middle of a riot there there were these there, there were political factions in the byzantine empire and they were known as like the blues and the greens and they got into a really big revolt against each other and and like i'm talking tens of thousands of people are like killed and um justinian could have been one of them and he was going to flee and abandon the city actually of constantinople and she was like you can't do that she was like if, if you leave the city if the leader and the emperor leaves the city you know then these these riots and these people that are rioting and they they win you can't do that and um that was kind of one of those pivotal moments where if it wasn't for theodora like justinian could have really like screwed up the leadership not only for himself but really of the entire empire so again very very impressive female figure in in world history i mean she ranks up there in all reality with like elizabeth the first catherine the great cleopatra um she's just not known as well because it you know a lot of people just don't really study the byzantine empire as much as they study the others so um another huge contribution by Justinian is called Justinian's Code. So you haven't heard me talk of any type of law code since the 12 tables. Well, it's because there really hadn't been a revamp of Roman law since the 12 tables. And so Justinian does that. And what's really amazing about Justinian is he writes this entire law code and it's massive. It's a lot of legislation and law. Um, it's, it's really kind of a life's work and very, very impressive. Uh, I feel like the last sentence on my slide, you know, Justinian's code shaped politics in Europe for centuries is a bit of an understatement. Um, you know, the Magna Carta will, there will be echoes of Justinian's code in the Magna Carta. Well, guys, like there's echoes of the Magna Carta, of course, in our own constitution. So you could say that there's even echoes of Justinian's code within the United States constitution. Um, it's going to shape again, the kind of the way things are processed in Europe, legally speaking, for many, many years to come. And he wrote it. Like I said, he wrote it. So uh, again, really impressive guy. Unfortunately, uh, again, he reigns until 465, until his death. Uh, come the 700s, you are going to see kind of the Byzantine Empire get much smaller um, it's going to basically be the, the size of modern day Turkey uh, is, is what the Byzantine Empire is going to kind of shrink down to. And from the 700s until, you know, 14, I think it's 53 uh, is when the Ottomans are going to take over Constantinople and sack the Byzantine Empire. But I mean, from the 700s until then, they maintain at least that much territory. Yeah, does it kind of like, you know, wax and wane from time to time? Yeah, but for the most part, it's about the size of modern day Turkey, okay? Um, and, you know, the reasons why that happens is, is same story, different verse. You know, if you've got too much territory too far away from your, you know, your capital city and where everything is, you're spending a lot of money on military infrastructure to maintain those borders. Um, they were constantly being attacked from the east because, hello, Constantinople is like the wealthiest city in the region. So, of course, everybody wants to control it and have a piece of it. So they're constantly trying to defend from the east while maintaining in the west. And it's just not a sustainable model, um, you know, and, and their treasury you know, is, is constantly depleted because of that. And then, you know, you have, you have the plague that hits during the dark ages, which doesn't ever help anything. Um, and then you have the rise of the Arab empire that really puts a pretty big strain on them, which again is, is the next unit guys that, it, you know, the rise of Islam and the Arab empire is, is unit four. So um, this is a like 14, 15 minute video on, uh, you know, kind of the Byzantines beginnings, as it says, and talks about Justinian and such, talks about Theodora, and just is a much more detailed version of, of history, okay, much more detailed than, than what I just gave you. So again, watch that for me. 
All right, so we're kind of transitioning back into the the religious conversation that we started out with, you know, with the early Christian church. Um, you know, the, the Byzantine Empire, they they looked at their leader of, of the church, you know, as the patriarch of Constantinople. They had, you know, once, once the Bishop of Rome started calling himself the Pope, uh, you know, they had to create a fancy name in Constantinople to to rival that. And so you have the patriarch in Constantinople who starts to head the Eastern Orthodox Church. And then, of course, the Pope that will head and control the Roman Catholic Church. So, again, the biggest issue that they continually had in the East with the Roman Catholic Church in the West was this, like, iconography and idolatry that, um, you know, they had put into practice with, you know, being able to pray or pay tribute to saints, Mary, like it, people that aren't God. They were, you know, the, in the East, they're like, no, 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 that's not okay. You're not supposed to be doing that. And so the Byzantine emperor, actually, Leo III, outlaws icons and idolatry, the use of pictures as worship at all, um, this becomes known as the iconoclast because in the West, of course, you have people that are like, uh, uh-uh, like I'm not following that. And plus, like, I don't care what the Byzantine emperor says, like he, my emperor, like, I mean, you, you start to have this very clear kind of salty, almost divide, um, between Christians, uh, you know, in the, in the, you know, 10th and 11th centuries. I mean, they really start to create a pretty hardcore division amongst one another. And this is the very first schism, okay, uh, and split. That's, you know, schism is basically like split of, of Christianity. So, you know, your first two denominations, now what, there are like 45,000 Christian denominations. But I mean, initially, you were either Roman Catholic or you were Eastern Orthodox, okay? Well, actually, originally you were just a Christian, um, you know, but as time moves on, as you've already learned from the previous video, you know, it starts morphing into Roman Catholic versus, again, Eastern Orthodox. So excommunications kind of crack me up because they are official documents that say, I don't like you. Seriously, it's an official signed and sealed document that basically is like, I don't like you and I don't want anything to do with you anymore. <laughs> That's an excommunication. Like, you're not allowed to talk to me. I'm not allowed to talk to you. Like, I don't, I mean, that that's, that's an excommunication. So what's really funny is after the, you know, during the iconoclast, this whole like icons and idolatry should be outlawed. And of course, Rome's over here going, you know, we don't really care what you say, Byzantine Empire. We're going to continue on the way that we've been doing things. So um, what's going to happen in 1054 is Pope Leo and Patriarch Michael are going to excommunicate each other. And this is like the official split that creates the first two branches of Christianity. It was, here's the deal, it was already split and operating pretty independently of each other for a while before 1054. But like the official split happens when they excommunicate each other, which is essentially like, we don't want anything to do with you. And, you know, the other side saying the same thing, and they officially sign it on a piece of paper that that's an excommunication. So Here's what's crazy and why at the bottom of this, it says, if you think this has nothing to do with today, dot, 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 dot. The Pope and the Patriarch, okay, so the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church and the Patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church will not speak to one another or have any interaction with each other for like almost a thousand years almost a thousand years. They don't meet again, like in the same room to reconcile the split that happened in 1054 
until I think 2017, like just recently this happened in Cuba. They met in Cuba. And, um, you know, cause the, the current Pope, Pope Francis, he's actually like, he's South American. I think he's from Argentina. I don't know. Now I'm going to Google it. Where is Pope Francis from? Argentina. Okay. So, uh, anyways, he, uh, they meet for the first time. Let me, let me make sure it's 2017. What year did the Pope and Patriarch meet again? 16, excuse me, 2016. I was off by one year. But um, so they don't, again, guys, that's crazy to me. I mean, that they don't meet. They have nothing to do with each other. And that the excommunication between the Roman Catholic Pope and the Eastern Orthodox Patriarch is going to stand from 1054 until 2016. And so this video is a video of them meeting and speaking. I mean, obviously, it's a pretty major moment in history that, of course, no mainstream news hardly picked up at all. So frustrating. Um, but anyways, it's it's pretty interesting. It's just it's just a little news clip of them talking, you know, again, it's been almost a thousand years. So it's it's a pretty I'm totally geeking out about it. I always do. But it's just kind of neat. OK, that's it. Um your formative assessment is over there. You know, everything that we've talked about with the early Christian church and then Justinian and the Byzantine empire come Monday, Charlemagne. That's what we're going to be talking about. Father of Europe. You know, we got to figure out how all of these, how do we go from Germanic tribes and the Saxons and the Huns and the Visigoths and Vandals? How do we go from all of that to like France and Spain and England in the Holy Roman Empire, how do how do we get all of those strong kingdoms that we know so well? So, well, here we go, guys. All right, that's it. Have a great weekend. Do good on your formative. Those of you that haven't taken your test, take your test. I put an announcement out there. All right, bye, guys. <laughs>